Hello, I'm Dr. Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory. And as I promised last week, we're now going to take a look at C-reactive protein, or CRP, in ME-CFS, or myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. So I'm going to show you some of the new data, and I'm going to show you a little bit about what I do with the data and how I think about working with the data. This is absolutely not a finished scientific product that I'm showing you. I'm showing you more of the kind of day-to-day -day types of analyses and thought process that we go through. So C-reactive protein, if you watched last week, I gave a lot more details about CRP last week, but the real quick story is it's one of our immune system's first responders to injury or infection. And we basically use a CRP measure as an indicator of your overall systemic body-wide inflammation. I think it's a really important driver of chronic pain and chronic fatigue in a lot of conditions. And I think it's something that we need to track and we need to reduce if we're going to lower pain, fatigue, and chronic conditions. Um, now, if you need more background information on CRP, I'm going to link two videos at the end of this video. One of them is the, the talk I did last week on Gulf War illness, and then one is an earlier video on inflammatory tests that you should consider uh, taking. So you can uh, take a look at those videos um, a little bit later. So right now, what I'm going to show you are data from 74 women with ME-CFS and also 31 women who are healthy controls. They don't have any fatigue and they don't have any pain. And these are data that I've collected over the past, I'd say, three years for a neuroimaging study, but these are blood tests that we run. So usually when you come into the lab, in addition to the main test, usually that's neuroimaging, I'll run a whole bunch of other tests as well. While you're here, we might as well get as much information as we can because that can help us answer other questions or understand the data even better. So if I see something in the brain, I may be able to tie that to something going on in the body. So we do run a lot of blood tests. And C-reactive protein is always one that I measure because I want to know, do you have a lot of systemic inflammation going on? So let's take a look at the data. Here it is. On the left, we see ME-CFS. On the right are the healthy controls. And we see a range of 0 to almost 12 milligrams per deciliter. I'm going to put some general thresholds right here. And let me add some labels here. Below 0.3 milligrams per deciliter is healthy. Between 0.3 and 1 is mild inflammation. Between 1 and 3 is moderate inflammation. And above 3 is severe inflammation. And the higher the values are, the more severe the inflammation is. And that continues to about 15 or so. And when you get to 15 and above, you're almost certainly dealing with an acute infection rather than a chronic disorder. Every once in a while, like maybe one out of 500 people will have chronically high values over 15, but in m almost all cases, it's inflammatory, it's acute, and it'll go back down. But I do see chronic values around 12 and 13 quite often. So anyway, these are the raw data. It, it is what it is. This is what the ME-CFS participants, what the inflammation they present with. So what do we do next with these data? I can't just do a paper just showing these scatter plots. Well, first thing, of course, I look, now I may have hypotheses, and if I do have a priori hypotheses, I will test those hypotheses. Now, in this case, CRP was not part of a, um, the direct, the uh, main part of a study, so I didn't have hypotheses. So first I make observations of the data, and I have three observations just by looking at these data as you're looking at them. First observation is the overall levels of CRP are clearly high. We see that not a single ME-CFS participant has a normal level of CRP, which is below 0.3. The majority have either moderate or severe inflammation. And this tells me right off the bat that inflammation is a common problem in ME-CFS. And the majority of the participants with ME-CFS have uncontrolled 
inflammation. So that's observation number one. Observation number two is there is considerable variation in CRP severity. You can see that. Part of my job is to figure out why there's variability like this. And so one of the next steps for me in the analyses is to see if I can predict that variability with some other variable that'll help us understand what's going on with inflammation in MECFS. Is there anything that predicts this range of severity, low versus high. For example, the people with really high CRP, do they have more fatigue? Are they just more severe cases of MECFS? Now, my guess is that's not the case, but we still have to test it. We don't know until we test it to make sure, and that's one possibility. Another example is um, over half of these people also meet criteria for fibromyalgia. Are the people with high CRP the ones that have MECFS and fibromyalgia? Maybe. I don't know. We'll have to test it. Are the people with high CRP the ones that have post-exertional malaise? Not everyone in the study has post-exertional malaise. Most of them do, but not all of them. So we need to test that. Are the ones with high inflammation the ones with neurological symptoms? So you can kind of see where I'm going at going here. We have lots of variables, and we see if any of them predict the variability. This is why when you come into my lab or other research group's lab, and we make you fill out so many questionnaires and do so many blood tests, this is the reason why. It's because we really want to figure out when there's a lot of noise in the signal or when there's a lot of variability, I think that's the better way to say it. We have to understand that variability because it could be that the way to successfully treat the people with high CRP is different than how we would successfully treat MECFS with low CRP. And so we need to figure out what's going on. So those are a few examples. I just threw a few off the top of my head. Now it's also possible, I want to throw out another, another I think, dist a very distinct possibility given some of my prior work. And that is when we look at these people with low CRP who have MECFS and low CRP, it might be that they have low CRP because we tested them on a good day. And again, if you tracked or if you followed my earlier work, you know that I talk about how CRP fluctuates with fatigue severity and pain severity. And so it's higher on high severity MECFS days. Now, why is that important for this test? It's because we oftentimes, because of the nature of the disease, have a participant scheduled to come in for blood draws and neuroimaging scans, and they call in the morning and they say, I just got hit with a particular severe case, uh, MECFS, this is a really bad day, I can't get out of my house today, I can't leave my bed today, so we're going to have to reschedule. And of course we reschedule, that's part of doing MECFS work, but we do have to keep in mind that it is possible that that is the very day where the CRP might have been sky high. And then when they wait a couple of weeks until they feel better, then they may be coming in when they feel at least well enough to come into the lab. That may be a day when their CRP has now dropped down considerably. My work, again, has shown that that is very likely happening in a lot of people with MECFS. And so that could uh, produce some, I guess, a confound is how we would say it, in the data. It could be that these people with low CRP, they're not always low. It's just when we test them, they're low. And that that's one of the reasons why I really, really want to get continuous CRP measurement. And we'll talk about that at another time. So again, that's why we collect so many variables. I want to identify subgroups. And I haven't conducted those analyses. I really have not looked at even these scatter plots that you're looking at now. This is the first time I'm looking at them as well. And there's a lot more we have to do with all this data. And I'll, I'll do that soon. In the meantime, if you have any other ideas of why there's so much variability and what that variability means or what may predict that variability, just put it down in the comments and I will read it. So that was observation number two. Observation number three that you're probably already eyeing right now is that the healthy controls are suspiciously high. Now, they're not as high as MECFS, but they're higher than should be for women that have no pain and no fatigue. So why is this happening? Why are we seeing elevated 
CRP in healthy women? Now, the short answer is, I don't know because I haven't run any tests or tested any hypotheses. Now, my working hypothesis that I've alluded to in previous videos is that the CRP has been elevated during or after the pandemic. And the reason I think that is because I remember that when we were finally able to resume our research, we were trying to recruit healthy individuals and we had to keep excluding them because their CRP was pathologically high, even though they didn't have any symptoms. And this was not the case before SARS-CoV-2. And so something happened after or during the pandemic. Now, we, I don't know exactly what was happening. I mean, we've, we've got some reasonable guesses, right? Either they were dealing with kind of a sub-threshold level of SARS-CoV-2, or it was because of a vaccine they had taken, or it was because now that people had been kind of locked down for a while and they were getting exposure to other people now, they were just getting hit by viri and bacteria and they had lost some of their defenses against that. And so maybe they were just getting kind of minor, low level sick a lot and just enough to bump up their CRP to, to unusual levels. So that's what I think happened. Um, I collected these data that I'm showing you over the past three years. So a lot of these were done when things were a little bit unsettled and there were more kind of immune exposures in the environment. If we did that now and I ran all new healthy controls, I suspect that those CRP levels would settle back down to more normal levels, but I don't know. That's a hypothesis. I would have to test it to be sure. Um, anyway, we knew when we went back to doing research in inflammation, we knew that there was going to be a lot of noise because of COVID-19 stuff. There was going to be, people are going to be hit. Their immune system will be hit. It's going to produce some noise in the data, but you know, we couldn't wait for years for that to settle down. So we just had to go forward. We collected the information as best as we could, and we just went on with our research. But this is a possible um, implication or ramification of going forward with research where healthy controls maybe weren't perfectly healthy at that time. And, and again, I think that's going to be less of an issue going forward. So anyway, that's a quick snapshot of my immune work. There's a lot more to come. I just wanted to show you that it clearly shows that inflammation is a big issue in MECFS. So that means we need to talk more about how to figure out if it's an issue for you how to track it, um, and how to reduce it. And we will talk about those things very soon. Um, for right now, I just wanted to show you, like with all my talks, we are generating new analyses every week. We just Every day, that's what I do. If I'm not writing a grant, then we're doing analyses or writing a paper. And there is a lot of stuff that we need to talk about. And this is just one of them. Now, my plan next week is I really want to talk about this continuous C-reactive protein, a monitor that you can wear at home and track whenever you run across something that engages your immune system. I think that would be the number, if I could have any tool right now, that would be it in terms of being able to uncover what is making you feel sick all the time. I think this is the way to do it. I think it'll be revolutionary. And so Next week, that's my plan to talk about what the devices look like and how we may get a hold of them and use them. After that, I'm probably going to turn my attention back to the brain because we have a lot of new brain analyses that we need to talk about. And neuroimaging is a large part of what I do. And I know everyone likes to hear about you know, where in the brain these problems are occurring. And we do have some clues as to how, why that's happening. So we'll talk about that soon as well. So I hope you're able to continue watching for all of that, and I will be back next Monday.